Hi everyone, I'm Miss Rita. You can also call me Miss Chen. I'm your PAD 270 Malaysian Politics course lecturer for this semester. Too bad that I can't conduct the class in a proper way and meet all of you face to face for this semester. However, I hope that all of you are taking advantage of this online class to the fullest. Do not hesitate to ask me yeah, on anything related to the course. I'll try to my best to guide and help all of you. Before we proceed to our lesson, please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel. Alright, let's start our lesson now. Before we proceed with the lesson, this is the syllabus content of our topic 1. Okay. 1.1 is Introduction to Malaysian Political History, in which we will learn about the political history of Malaysia. 1.2 will be discussing on characteristics of traditional Malay politics, in which there are two, two terms that are really important in understanding the characteristics of traditional Malay politics. The first one is the feudal system, and then the second one is social contract. Next, okay, 1.3, we are going to learn about the contribution of the immigrants, in which there are two immigrants that are very important in understanding this uh, subject, the Chinese and the Indian. Next one, 1 1.4, we are going to learn about the contribution of the British, British, mostly or mainly about the modern political system that were introduced in our country. Second one, about Malayan Union. What is Malayan Union? I bet you all know already because we used to learn this in history, right? And then the third one, bureaucracy. Next one, democracy. Point one, point five, we are going to learn about the continuation of traditional politics. So you will be covering these five topics in chapter one. Alright class, let us proceed uh, to our first topic of the first chapter for today. Alright, the political history in Malaysia based on chronology or phases. So there are five phases in political history in Malaysia. The first one is phase one, prehistoric. Phase two, early Hindu or Malay kingdom. Phase three, Islam and the golden age of Malacca in which we will discuss this further later on. Phase 4, the colonial era. And phase 5, post-World War II, to independence and the forming of Malaysia. I will skip on phase 2, yeah? Because uh, this one seems not that uh, important to the course. Okay, let's see what Tunku Abdul Rahman said about history. Whatever its past may be, a nation can only be true to itself if it learns its history. So you know, right? In history is very important. Next slide. Alright, this is the first phase. Okay, what is phase one? Phase one is um, before the availability of written record. Uh, it is also called the prehistoric period. It involves the Stone Age system. Okay, you can see here the period for Paleolithic is also called the Old Stone Age before 12,000 BC. The Mesolithic, also called Middle Stone Age, 12,000 BC to 8,500 BC. And also Neolithic, it is called New Stone Age, 8,500 BC to 300 BC. Next is Metal Age, yeah? after Stone Age. It is 300 BC to 1400 AD. And then Iron, 300 BC to 1400 AD. Okay, this is the details. For Paleolithic, I want you to concern on the area. Okay, area of the period. Okay, and the main characteristics of the inhabitants. So what are the main characteristics for Paleolithic period? So people live in caves, main activity was collecting forest products and hunting, started using stone tools, 
and tools were also simple and crude. These are the area Tampan, Estuary Perak, Miah Cave in Sarawak, and Tingkayu in Sabah. The next one is Mesolithic, or it is also called Middle Age Stone. And then the main characteristics of inhabitants during this period are they are also live in caves and also along rivers and lakes. They have started farming, they use more refined stone tools, and they are able to make earthenware. The area here is in Kelantan, Kecil Cave in Pahang, Kedah, Jenderam Hile in Selangor, Madai Cave in Sabah, Garmantang Cave in Sabah, and also Niah Cave in Sarawak. Yeah. Next one. Next one is the Neolithic Age, also called the New Stone Age. Okay, what are the main characteristics? They use more sophisticated stone tools compared to the previous age. Yeah. They started rearing livestock and also started communicating to each other. They also start creating objects and using accessories. So these are the area. Quite the same with the previous age, actually. And then, the last one is Metal Age. So what are the main characteristics? Population grew, develop residential areas in wide open land near rivers. They are more orderly and sanitary lifestyle. And they practice social customs, yeah. So these are the area, Long River, Lang River in Selangor, Langa River in Selangor as well, Moa River in Johor, Tumbling River in Pahang, and also Terengganu River in Terengganu. Okay, let's move on to phase four. Because I have mentioned just now, right, that I will skip phase two and phase three. Since phase three, we will be discussing it further later on. Okay, for phase four, the colonial era. The earliest record of colonization in Malaya actually starts in 1511. Okay, so the Portuguese came and conquered Malacca in 1511, which was led by the governor of Portuguese India, Alfonso de Arbukur. I don't know how to pronounce that. Maybe you know it well. This was a milestone for the Western colonists looking to extend their empire to East Indies. Yeah? Okay. The colonization of Malacca by the Portuguese forced the last Sultan, which is Sultan Mahmud Shah, who was in reign from 1488 mm -hmm. until 1511, to retreat to the further reaches of his empire. He then established new ruling dynasties called Johor and Perak. Malacca then continued to prosper under Portuguese rule until the Dutch came into the picture. Okay, so for the Dutch, with the help of the Sultan of Johor, who is descended from a Malaccan Sultan, the, Ju the Dutch captured the port in 1641 and ruled over it until 1795 where Malacca was ceded to the British under an exchange program for Batavia, Jakarta in Indonesia. The Anglo-Dutch Treaty of 1824 defined the boundaries between British Malaya and the Netherlands East Indies, which become Indonesia now. On the other hand, the anglo siamese Treaty of 1909 defined the boundaries between British Malaya and Siam, which became Thailand now. Lah. Okay, for British, under the British East India Company, Malacca was developed. They spread their influence all over the area, enforcing control over the trade industry and employing governors to rule each state. The company was eventually replaced by direct administration from the Crown Colony. Okay, the next one. Japanese invasion. Okay, for Japanese invasion, Japanese invasion during World War II ended British domination in Malaya. It is in power from 1946 to 1948. Yeah, uh, I mean British. Japanese also happened to change the style of at 
administration during their reign. The Japanese surrender from Malaya after being defeated by the Allies in World War II when atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima on August 6, 1945, followed by Nagasaki three days later. So for British military army, BMA is British military army, yeah, then took the reign and implemented decolonization process to Malaya. Decolonization refers to the action or process of a state withdrawing from a former colony, leaving it independent. Remember that, yeah? Okay. For phase five, cross independence to the Federation of Malaysia. Federation of Malaya was formed in 1948 and was ongoing until the year 1957, where it got its independence on the 31st of August 1957. You know this, right? Because we always have uh, Sambutan Hari Kemerdekaan, Independence Day, and you, you have your holiday that time, so you must be remembering this date very well. On the other hand, Sabah and Sarawak only gained their independence, independent status in 1963. Sabah gained its self-government on the 31st of August 1963. Meanwhile, for Sarawak, Sarawak established its first cabinet on the 22nd of July 1963. Uh, that is why Sarawak has their own Sarawak Day on the 22nd July of 1963. Yeah? 1963 is the, uh, is the year that you have to remember. It is very important for Sabah and Sarawak as well. Federation of Peninsula or Malaya Sabah and Sarawak under Malaysia took place in September 16, 1963. Okay, you can see the summary of it inside one picture here. I already combined it. The prehistoric phase and then early Hindu or Malay kingdoms followed by Islam in the Golden Age of Malacca and then colonial in Malaysia. I mentioned it just now, Portuguese under the Dutch and then British. Japanese invention and British back yeah, under British military army after the World War II ended and the independence and onwards 1957 until present. So class, please bear in mind that for traditional Malay politics, the terms of feudal system and social contract are very important in understanding the practicality of the administration during that period of time. In a simple understanding, feudal system is a system that explains the connection between the ruling and the rule class in one sovereignty. Meanwhile, for a social contract, it is the idea or the theory that stated that there is an agreement, an intangible one, exists between the ruling and the rule class about their scope of duties towards each other. As you can see from the slide, the whole sentences explain on the duty of the ruler and the ruling class in a feudal system. The duty of their ruler is seen as having the obligation to rule fairly. As for the ruling class, they have the responsibility to obey the ruler of the country. Alright, that's it. Next. Okay, what can you see from the picture? This is Malacca, yeah? So we are going to talk about Malacca afterwards. Okay, about the Malacca Sultanate, we are going to talk about the background or history of Malacca's opening, the golden age of Malacca, the contributing factors to the prosperity of Malacca, and also the fall of Malacca. These two points, the contributing factors, and also the fall of Malacca are very important for your exams yeah so please bear in mind that these two points are important okay so history of malacca's opening okay malacca is well known for its interesting and unique history it begins when parameswara a prince from palembang got involved in a war for the succession of the Majapahit Empire during the late 14th century. 
I know you all know about this, right? Because we used to learn this in history a lot, right? After his defeat in the war, he sought refugee in Tamase, which was under the influence of the Siamese. After being expelled from Tamase by the Siamese invaders, Para Meswara and his comrades made their way to Moa and then to Sungai Ujong before taking a stop in Bertam, which is located nearby the outfall of the Malacca River. This happened around 1396, yeah? So shortly after they arrived in Bertam, Para Meswara saw his hunting dogs kicked by a white deer. I'm not sure whether it's a white deer or a brown deer, but uh, it is written in history that it is white deer. He was extremely impressed with the bravery and strength shown by the white deer. So he felt like he just witnessed a miracle and he believed that it is a good sign. So he was inspired to start his new empire there. He asked his comrades about the name of the tree that sheltered him when he saw the incident. And he was told that the name of the tree is Malacca. Thus, he made the decision of naming the land after the beautiful and shady Malacca tree. Apparently, Parameswara's choice of location is a perfect one. Malacca's location is very strategic. It is located around the riverbanks of the Straits of Malacca, which connects China to India and the East, making it a convenient site for a trading hub. It then attracted many Arab merchants as well as those from the East and the West, turning Malacca into a bustling entry port with hundreds of ships docking in every year. So, Golden Age of Malacca. Malacca continued to become a famous Malay trading hub in East. Some of the goods available in Malacca were Chinese silk and China, uh, from China, camphor from Borneo, sandalwood from Timor, nutmeg and cloth from Moluccas, gold and paper from Sumatra, as well as tin from the Malay, Tanah Melayu. The Gujarat traders from Western India came in to trade textiles and Malacca became known worldwide as a center for silk and porcelain trading. Also, to keep its tradition at bow, the Sultan of Malacca enlisted the help of the Chinese, mainly the voyages of Admiral Cheng Ho between 1440 to 1433. Malacca prospered and not long later, the Ming Emperor bequeathed a Chinese princess named Hang Lipo to Sultan Muzaffar Shah. This is very famous, like Hang Lipo. This is the first multiracial union ever recorded in history. So you can see here the products that uh, represent each country. The vase and the silk from China. This is from India from Borneo, from Sumatra, from Malaya and Moluccas, and from Timor. All of these products were mentioned earlier on here, from here. Okay. Alright, next, we proceed to the main, main factors to the prosperity of Malacca. Actually, this is very straightforward, but then this is also very important for your exam. Maybe. Okay, so what are the contributing factors to the prosperity of Malacca? The first one is the geographical factor, of course, right? Because Malacca is located in a strategic area, strategic river, bank, river banks, right? So, strategic location midway trade routes between India and China. The, the second one is political factors. Efficient legal and administrative machinery. Strong trade and diplomatic ties with foreign countries, especially China yeah, and India. Strong military system to ensure and control the situation. The third one, economic factors. Reasonable taxation system. Usage of currency system facilitate trade transaction. The fourth one is social factor. Malay as lingua franca for better communication. 
center for the spread of Islam. So everyone that came in Malacca that uh, that period, they will speak in lingua franca because that time Malay language is uh, universal. Everyone speak Malay. So you must be very proud, right? The fifth one is facilities, underground warehouses. And then for fall of Malacca, there are two factors in which it involves the internal and also the external factors in contributing the fall of Malacca. Okay, what is related to the internal one? Internal factors. There are several internal factors that contribute to the fall of Malacca. Yeah? Okay, the first one, weak administration costs, the Malays became hostile to Indian Muslims. Disunity among the people. And then continued misunderstanding and disputes cause segregation among people. The betrayal among ministries and also bribery and corruption were common and high taxes forced merchants to divert to other ports. And then meanwhile for the external factors, the points are the discovery of Cape of Good Hope made it easier to sail from the west to the east. The west were competing to conquer trades in the east. And then the intention to spread Christianity by the West. Chinese. 
ties between Malacca and China during the Malay Sultanate of Malacca involved the Chinese. They started to come in big numbers in mid-19th century as a result of the opening of tin mines, yeah? perlombongan, activity perlombongan made them come here. Mostly are from Fukien, Kuangtung, and Guangxi in South China. So they are consist of Hokkien, Cantonese, Hakka, Teochew, and Hailam. These are all their roots. Meanwhile, for the Indian, trading in the ports in the states in Malaya and the Tamil Islam known as the propagators of Islam during that time. Meanwhile, for um, during the British period, the British occupation in Penang in 1786, Indian laborers migrated to the island to work in sugarcane plantation and as domestic help. Indian prisoners were also brought in by the British to help construct building and roads, mostly originated from South India. Yeah? So they are consist of Tamil, Malayali, Telugu and Sikh. So this schedule uh, explains everything in general on the contributions of both community. So in terms of economy, the Chinese usually are the merchants, they are also the businessmen and also the craftsmen. Transportation companies, construction and estate are conquered by this community. Mostly are the Chinese, huh? the one that uh, contribute in transportation system in Malaya at that time. Uh, meanwhile, for Indian, they are the Chetir, loan providers. Uh, they are very good in money. Yeah? Business, restaurants, hairdressing and cloth stores. They are also the laborers. They get involved in trading as well. And also medical and legal professions. How about the politics? The contribution of these two communities in politics. So for Chinese, they are mostly English educated, yeah? So the Malayan Chinese Association, MCA, is contributed by the Chinese. Labour Party, the People's Progressive Party, and the People's Action Party is also consists of Chinese. How about the Indian? Mostly is MIC. In terms of social cultural, Chinese contribute in Mandarin language and also the religion of Buddhist. Meanwhile, for Indian, majority of them speak Tamil, so uh, they also contribute for in organizations based on castas and also in Hindu, Sikh, Christian, and Islam. All right, next we are going to see the contribution of the British to our country's political system. So I have summarized the points here. The first one is the modern political system. The second one is MU. MU is not Manchester United, yeah? it's Malayan Union. And then the third one is bureaucracy system. And the fourth one is democracy system. So democracy is introduced by the British to our country during the era of colonization. Okay, so this is a summary as well. Under point modern political system, there are four important main criteria or main points that you need to remember. The first one is the straight settlements. So straight settlements is introduced by the British in 1826 and the states involved are the Penang, Singapore and Malacca. These are the important ports yeah, last time. And then the second one is the resident system. Uh, in which it was introduced in 1874 until 1889. Okay, states involved are Perak, Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, and also Pahang. Next one, the Federated Malay States, or in Malay, it is called Negeri Negeri Melayu Bersekutu. It was introduced in 1896, in which the states involved are Perak, Selangor, Negeri Sembilan, and Pahang. Next one, the unfederated Malay states. Um, in Malay, it is called Negeri Negeri Melayu Tidak Bersekutu. One is Bersekutu, meanwhile another one is Tidak Bersekutu. So year introduced was 1909 until 1990. 
the states involved are Perlis, Kedah, Kelantan, and Terengganu, as well as Johor. So this is the Straits settlement just now. Okay, involves uh, uh, Kedah, Sultan Abdullah of Kedah, French is like in Penang, and also Singapore by Thomas Stanford Raffles, and then in Melaka. Second one just now, the residence system starts in Para in 1874, uh, in which resident will be advising the Sultan in the system, and then the British will protect the state. Within a month, Selangor and Negeri Sembilan accept residence. In 1888, Pahang follow suit. And then the third one just now, the Federated Malay States or Negeri Negeri Melayu Bersekutu. So the Federation Agreement is uh, in 1896, yeah, uh, which consists of Selangor, Perak, Pahang, and Negeri Sembilan. One central ruling, more unitary than federal. So the one that was giving instruction was the resident general, directly to the resident and departmental heads doing likewise to their state or counterparts. So that means uh, above resident is the resident general. So resident general, so resident need to do report to resident general. Resident general to advise on all aspects except on issues relating to Islam and Malay customs. Periodic meetings of all Malay rulers and residents. Next one. The Unfederated Malay States or Negeri Negeri Melayu Tidak Bersekutu. Okay, it was established in 1909 based on Bangkok Treaty, uh, in which it consists of Kelantan, Terengganu, Kedah, and Perlis. And what are the effects of the treaty? It restricted Siamese power, difficult for other Western powers to intervene, and the expansion of British power, of course, in Ma Malay States. In 1914, Johor accepted British advisor under this uh, system, and in 1999, in 1999, 1919, British administratively combined the five states as the non-federated Malay states. God save our gracious King. responses received and reasons on why MU was opposed by the Malays and how did they show the dissatisfaction. Uh, Malayan Union is no longer exists. Yeah? It was being replaced with the Federation of Malaya. Okay, the first one, why MU? The idea was expressed by the British prior to post-war condition to ease administration in Malaya under one system. Alright, so how was the implementation toward MU? So the implementation toward MU, okay. the idea of the union 
was actually first expressed by the British in October 1945. Plans had been presented to the war cabinet as early as May 1944, in the aftermath of the Second World War by the British military administration. Prior to World War II, British Malaya consisted of three groups of polities, the Protectorate of the Federated Malay States, five protected unfederated Malay states, and the Crown Colony of the Strait Settlements. So, on the 1st April 1946, the Malayan Union officially came into existence with Sir Edward Gent as its governor. It's Sir Edward Gent here. Combining the federated Malay states, unfederated Malay states, and the strait settlements of Penang and Malacca under one administration. The capital of the union was in Kuala Lumpur. The former strait settlement of Singapore was administered as a separate crown colony. The feedback or responses? So, Sir Harold McMichael was assigned the task of gathering the Malay state rulers' approval for the Malayan Union in the same month. In a short period of time, he managed to obtain all the Malay rulers' approval. It's magic, right? It's amazing. The reasons for their agreement, despite the loss of political power that it entailed for the Malay rulers, has been much debated because the consensus appears to be that the main reasons were that as the Malay rulers were of course resident during the Japanese occupation, they were open to the accusation of collaboration and that they were threatened with detournment. Hence, the approval was given, though it was with utmost reluctance. Okay, So they were being threatened. That was why they signed the agreement. Then reasons on why MU was opposed by the Malays and how did they show the dissatisfaction? First one, uh, the Malays don't like the way Sir Harold McMichael threatened their Sultan. So Sir Harold McMichael get the signature of all Malay rulers to make Malayan Union the real one. He threatened to lowering the Malay rulers from the throne if they did not accept the Malayan Union. Malay rulers also were not given enough time to consult with the Council of State or his advisors, as happened to the Sultan of Perak. Sultan of Perak is one of the examples. Yeah. Thus, all of these situations strengthened the bond between the Malay to oppose Malayan Union. And then the second reason, challenges to the Malay supremacy. So, the Malay community worry that the Malay civilization might be eroded, if MU is practiced. This may threaten the system of monarchy, the Malay language and Jawi script position, in which these three will not practice, will not be practiced, or not in use anymore in the future. So the situation challenged the Malay supremacy. Thus, the Malay concern and ensures that they might lose their identity. The third one, uh, just solely citizenship. Okay, what is just solely citizenship? Just solely citizenship, a liberal nationality status quo, threatens the indigenous Malay people as the number of Malays to be small due to the influx of immigrants. The Malayan Union gave equal rights to people who wished to apply for citizenship. It was automatically granted to people who were born in any state in British Malaya or Singapore and were living there before 15 February 1942. Born outside British Malaya or the Strait Settlements only if their fathers were citizens of the Malayan Union and those who reached 18 years old and who had lived in British Malaya or Singapore 10 out of 15 years before 15 February 1942. The group of people eligible for application of citizenship had to live in Singapore or British Malaya for five out of eight years preceding the application had to be of good character, understand and speak the English or Malay language, and had to take an oath of allegiance to the Malayan Union. 
Meanwhile, for number four, the elimination of the sovereignty and authority of the Malay ruler or Raja Raja Melayu. So this point is very straightforward. Okay, next one, next slide. Sorry. Opposition. Right. How did the Malays confronted or opposed to MU? AMNO was formed during this period, yeah. AMNO, a Malay political association formed by Dato on Jaffa on the 1st March of 1946, led the opposition against the Malayan Union. Malays also wrote war white bands around their heads, signifying their mourning for the loss for the Sultan's political rights. So they utilize civil disobedience as a means of protest by refusing to attend the installation ceremonies of the British governors. And they had also refused to participate in the meetings of the advisory councils. Hence, Malay participation in the government bureaucracy and the political process had totally stopped. The British had finally recognized this problem and took measures to consider the opinions of the major races in Malaya before making amendments to the constitution. The Malayan Union was dissolved and replaced by the, the Federation of Malaya on the 1st February 1948. Okay. Next point, bureaucracy. This is also very straightforward from the point of administration. States were divided into district, division and residency, parish and villages, each has its own head. Police force was established for safekeeping. Another contribution, democracy. Uh, this is also very straightforward since we are, Malaysia is a democracy state. So uh, you should understand this very well. So Malaysia, Practice parliamentary democracy, a form of government in which the party or a coalition of parties with the greatest representation in the parliament forms the government, its leader becoming prime minister, just like uh, our country right now. And then constitutional monarchy. Malaysia is a federal constitutional monarchy where the Yang Dipetuan Agung is elected every five years among the nine sultans of the Malay states by the conference of rulers. Alright, we have come to an end of this chapter, the last topic, 1.5, the continuation of traditional politics. So what are the points that contribute to the continuation? First one is elite circulation. Governing elites are directly and indirectly concerned with administration. They play highly important role and enjoy prestigious place in society. Non-governing elites are not connected with administration, but occupy such a place in society that they somehow influence the administration. So, whether particular elites stay in power or not, whether they are partially or fully replaced or not, the fact remains that they remain in vital positions and characterize the development and progress of a given society. So this point mean, mean that um, the elite, they, their status quo remain untouched. Then the next one, Malay supremacy, ketuan yang Melayu, such as the Yang di Pertuan Agong, the Malay rulers, the special rights of Malay and Bumi Putra based on Article 143 remain untouched as well. And then uh, point 1, point 5, point 3, Islam and Malay language. Islam is the official religion of the Federation based on Article 3 and Article 5, 152 which uh, talk about Malay language also remain for official purposes. This is the main reference if you happen to want to get the book for yourself. Membayar atas nama Dewan Pembayar dan Mas Matusi. Okay. That's all for chapter 1. So all the best and good luck.